Hello and welcome to today's expert series webinar on training in the pandemic. Today is the fourth edition and we've something a bit different for you today with the addition of a customer perspective. Uh, today's guests are wind engineering contractors to land wind service and their GWO training provider AIS training who will tell us what it's been like on both sides. Of the the agenda today, we've got experts, you can see us all on the screen. Um, I'll introduce, we'll dive straight into what they've brought us today. Uh, then we'll look closer behind the scenes at AIS's own uh, adaptations post COVID-19. Uh, the main part of the webinar should take about 20, 25 minutes and then we'll take your questions. Uh, the slides are available now in a handout. Uh, your microphones are muted, uh, but when we get to the Q&A, we'll ask you to unmute yourself and then you can ask us questions directly. In the meantime, please go to have a question, you know, prompted by something that anybody says. Um, just put it in the question box and uh, that could, you put, could put you at the head of Q anyway. So it's always a good idea to ask questions as soon as you think of them. I'm Ralph Savage, uh, I'll be hosting our discussion today. I've been at GWO for a couple of years. I look after comms and stakeholder management. And from our team is uh, Jagob Lauholst. He's uh, CEO of Global Wind Organization. He's led the Secretariat since 2014 when it was formed. Uh, he's held leadership positions uh, with Wind Denmark and as a board member of uh, Wind Europe. Jonathan Murray is our first guest today from Mulhan, where he's worked for the past three years. Uh, more recently as a project manager and uh, previously out in the field, carrying out what looks like pretty much every task you can think of at sites like Sandbank Offshore and Arcona. Uh, Jonathan's co-panelist is Nikolai Guldner, who's been with Mulhan since 2018. Nikolai is responsible for all operational HSE on behalf of uh, 450 technicians employed by the company. So we're looking forward to, you know, your contribution to give us a perspective uh, in terms of keeping all those people trained and safe to work out in the field. So welcome to both of you guys. Now the final part of today's Trinity are our guests from AIS. Paul Knowles has been in senior management of large sites governed by uh, the UK's control of major accident hazards regulations since the late 90s, right? Uh, Paul. Um, since yeah. 2017, he's led the various training businesses within the 3T Energy Group, of which AIS is one. Uh, Paul's colleague Gavin Taylor has been with AIS since 2014, and he looks after theirs and their sister company, Survivex's client relationships. Uh, he came into the sector following a career in banking, where he also specialised in commercial customer relations. So, welcome to everybody. So before we begin, uh, I'd like to just quickly recap on some of the figures we shared last week in our forecast on the GWO Network's reopening plans. You can see a much more detailed analysis of the results of the market survey, uh, in a short film on, that's on our YouTube channel. But just to remind you, we were expecting 60% of the network to have reopened by last week. Here on the screen, you've the results of any providers in the top 10 markets. Uh, it might be a little bit tricky to uh, but if you filter out column two on the left, which is companies who had yet to decide, uh, and two columns on the right, which is those who are reopening in June, the estimate now is that 3% of them would be open by the end of this week. Um, we also asked the network what their expectation was training volumes between May and July. This month, the market estimated 57% of typical training volumes uh, would take place. July, the forecast to 91%. Uh, we've got our fingers toes crossed. Situation will allow the network to return to these kinds of volumes because uh, companies like our guests from Moon today will tell you being able to able to access uh, training is a big safety risk for the industry and, and one that we all hope we can we can rectify. So now we'll move on to our Fourth topic, and reminder that GWO and its members subscribe to the advice provided by your governments and the World Health Organization. We're here to learn from each other, uh, not to encourage anybody to reopen or deliver training where it isn't safe to do so. So uh, I hope that's clear enough for everybody. 
So as I said, we're really pleased to have these two excellent panelists with us today. Um, Paul, I'll ask you quickly, if you don't mind, to tell us a, a bit about AIS, um, a little elevator speech, if you don't mind. Yep. Um, so AIS was formed um, around about 11 years ago. Um, it was formed from a, um, a sole, uh, sole proprietor, so to speak, started up and um, we went up to around about 150 to 200 employees post COVID-19. Um, that was on multiple sites. Um, our site here in Newcastle, we also had a site in, um, or we have a site in um, Aberdeen and also we have a number of sites across the, the globe in um, in the MENA region, in Houston. And what it was, it in essence started as a, um, an insulation business um, and then Paul seen the need, um, our president Paul as well, we're all called Paul. Um, our president Paul um, found that the training in the industry wasn't to the standard he, he actually liked. Um, so what he started to do is he started to build AIS training and it started in its humble roots, I think, via doing um, rope access through IRATA ropes then continually built upon that success that he was doing, heavily reinvested. So um, he was going into every new center. So as soon as Arata Ropes was finished, he then went into um, his working height unit, then went into um, painter blasting, then went into um, MGI to then um, open up the GWO. So we opened up the GWO sites. And like it says on there, it's that we're on number one um, in the UK for, for the training if you amalgamate our certs um, across the, the multiple sites. Um, so yeah, it started from humble beginnings, but now we're, we're number one, um, both GWO in the UK, but also for our other part of our business, which is the oil and gas side. Um, if we looked at our PITO um, certifications, we're also um, the highest um, provider in that sector as well. And then also been diversifying just recently. So going into a little bit of utility side and um, going into nuclear, but predominantly started from a training company, but just since probably two, three years ago, started to go into um, managed training services, TMS contracts. So where we'll actually look after the whole company management for the, the delegate or the, the, the client, and um, based on looking after the cert, making sure certs are uploaded, making sure that any expiries, compliance gaps, um, so managing that whole process which then brought upon itself something slightly different because we've now got 450-ish suppliers across the UK. So not only do we train ourselves, but we also manage um, the training for the third parties. And that's something that's been quite interesting during the COVID-19 process of making sure the kind of stuff that we've done in our center is making sure that's replicated in our supply chain that we're currently looking after for our clients. Because like I said, there's roughly between four to 450 other um, suppliers as well. So quick potted history. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much. And Nikolai, um, can you give us a similar kind of overview of Moulihan Wind Service, please? Yeah, so uh, Moulihan Wind Service is part of this uh, uh, Moulihan Group. Um, which has been doing surface treatment and, and scaffolding for yeah 130 years. So that's the expertise. And then Milhan Wind Service is about three years old, or just three years old last month, um, and does a full scope of uh, of uh, wind service. Um, yeah, we do it, uh, high voltage onshore installations, offshore installations, paint, and uh, and then repair on blades. And it goes from small sites to two, three people, uh, up to uh, to maybe 25, 50 people on uh, pre-assembly sites. So uh, yeah, that's a small recap of uh, Wilhelm Wind Service. Okay, thanks very much. So the reason why we have you guys here today is is to turn the tables a bit. Uh, many of us have experienced the relaxation of uh, lockdown in our own countries. Um, we know what it's like to social distance in a supermarket, uh, but what's it like when you go and do a GWO training course? Um, before we jump into that part of it, though, Nikolai, can we start with a general picture from the Moulihan perspective on what it's been like, um, you know, before and, and, and during the pandemic? What impact did the pandemic have on your operation, on your workforce? Um, I think that the Milan Wind Service is quite lucky that we're in a in a business that's critical for infrastructure and and all of that. So in that sense, it's not been hit that hard. I think most of the period we've been working uh, kind of normally. Uh, of course, with the restrictions, it's a bit different on site and 
and traveling across borders, training providers. But uh, but in general, the uh, the operations have been continuing quite normally. Yeah. But for uh, for a, a manager who's responsible for operational HSE, I mean, have you experienced some of what we've been being told is 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 a potential problem? You know, the inability to access training is that is that uh, become an issue for you? I th I don't see it as a problem uh, with all the existing uh, certificates, but training new people is is definitely a, a challenge. So that's been been very hard to get uh, new people on sites, especially when we're ramping up the to the to the high season um but 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 we've been able to keep the the, the guys on on the job and, and and rotating and using our own guys so in that sense we've been we've been doing all right but of course we do uh, get some uh certificates that expire and that's of course a problem but that when we don't ex extend them more than we do then i don't see the big problem in that no. yeah okay thanks very much for that so uh, Jonathan, you um, took yourself and a team to AIS for a Slinger Signaler course recently. I think it was uh, a week or two ago. Uh, we've got a picture from one of the practical lessons here on screen uh, in the new uh, socially distance environment. Can you tell us first of all about the job roles of the team taking the training and why you would do this? Yeah. Uh... For this for this training, we had we actually had a bit of a, a bit of a mix of guys um, who do have, who have different positions on site. Um, so myself um, is actually an, as an installation lead on this site, and then we had uh, we had some mechanical and installation guys who would be working with the cranes doing this installation. Um, this this training is actually a mandatory training for for all of our personnel on this site. So all of our guys go through it. Um, we had um, four guys who had previous experience with doing um, doing other training before the GWO Slinger Signal was brought in, um, who done different sorts of Slinger Banksman training. And then we had one guy who was uh, who was brand new to the industry who, who, who were were bringing in and trained up to bring in and uh, as as kind of uh, an apprentice. So yeah, we had we had a bit of a mix, to be honest, mm -hmm. with, uh, with regards to the roles and positions that people will be doing. Yeah, and you were amongst the first, at least that we've spoken to, uh, to experience training in this new uh, this new approach. Uh, what were your first impressions, and how did it go? Yeah, first impressions are very good. You know, it's uh, it's it, it's not too dissimilar to what we're experiencing. Here on site, there's a there's a lot of things that uh, AIS training had put in place that, that that we have we have in place over here as well. You know, with, for instance, in the canteens, the, the same sort of segregation of where people can sit and the distance that they have to have between them, and the um, and the temperature checks as you're going in and the the, the hand washing facilities. Uh, it was it, it was very good. It was it, it was what you would what you to expect when you arrive somewhere you can see that the the, the floors marked clearly for where people need to stand and uh, you know um the segregation like i say that the the only difference that we can find with uh, with regards to how we would not see it in a training center was obviously the restricted numbers um yeah. quite fortunate as well that the, the guys at ais managed to plan it so it was it was five five guys on this training session they all they all work with with us, and um, these guys are working together on site uh, and, and traveling together. So it was good that we could we could contain those guys together, and uh, yeah, we, they were they were mixed in with with people where they didn't know where they came from or or anything like that. So yeah, it it it, it was it was uh, it was dealt with very well as as far as we were concerned. Do you think there were any? challenges in in the kind of learning experience you know you're on a course for a couple of days are, are there any disadvantages in the way that it's changed I, I i don't believe so to be honest i think that um i think that uh, like i say we, we you know we we had a we had a trainer there with with five guys you know so um we and then we we had the guy in the crane as well when we were doing the practical work outside so um we we, we we had uh, 
full attention of the of the guy who was who was doing the training. You know, it was uh, it was it was very good. I, I didn't really feel that there was any sort of limitations or restrictions to what we were there to learn. You know, so uh, no, I I didn't see any any issues at all. Yeah. So in a way, the net benefit of having fewer people and more attention from an instructor is is an obvious gain in a way. At least yeah, your so yeah, it, you know, yeah. There's, uh, it, it's a if, if people are, you know, a, a reduced amount of people there, so yeah, you, you can get your questions across, and uh, you know, it, it's it's easy to 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 have small discussions and doesn't go on for too long because uh, there's only so many people there. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've I've done quite a lot of training over at the centre in Newcastle over the years, so um, the the way that it was run. It, it, it really wasn't too dissimilar to when I've been on training courses with uh, with with double the, the people. It was, it was it was very good. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good to hear. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Um, so, Paul, I'm going to bring you into this a little bit. We heard from Jonathan there about his experiences. Uh, you've rolled out a load of new courses. I can imagine you've been working. You know. 24 hours a day pretty much um you know not least hygiene social distancing but it solutions as well has there been a big investment of time and resources in this uh I think, to get yeah, yeah most definitely i think the the biggest thing for us is with us being a training management service company as well is that we in essence have to then look at social distancing for all of our office staff so we've had to take a large a large proportion of our office staff are working from home and which then made um, we had to put set up our, our whole IT infrastructure for all of our um, individual people, but then also using teams like we are here. So we're, it was then getting in touch with the, the guys three times a week. So we'd do our meetings on Monday and Wednesday and Friday. So that was kind of different to everybody where we'd usually have just you know, gone around the corner and had a little chat, whereas now we're having to run our meetings and um, via teams. So a hell of a lot of infrastructure went in for the IT side. I think on the, the time base, I think we probably had. I would say about four, four to five weeks when we're total in lockdown, um, where we had the time really to be thinking about how we're going to reopen and how we're going to reopen safely. And I think the point that was raised before is that we did make a conscious decision to reduce our numbers on the course. Um, so that was one of the key things that we looked at is how do we keep it safe, but also how do we bring back a small amount of trainers? So therefore, we're not just flooding the flooding the gates, so to speak, of try and get as many people through the centre as possible. So we went to like a 20 to 30 percent capacity cap to where we used to used to run. And that was more so based so we can make sure that the message that we wanted to put in place was then disseminated against all out to all of the trainers. And what we did is uh, myself and Gavin engaged with a number of customers. So we put together probably a 10, 15 page bullet point um, presentation that we spoke to all of our key stakeholders prior to us even um, opening any doors. So that was probably done about two weeks to three weeks prior, where we're going through all of the processes and procedures that we're gonna put in place, trying to learn from um, the industry as well. So I think you picked up before about the supermarket. I think that was one of our first things we looked at is that the supermarket was one of the first, well, they remained open, but just how their evolution was. So the started from everywhere is just standing, yeah, and trying to um, trying to work out whether you're two meters apart. So eventually, there's um, kind of um, lines painted onto the floor. Then I then I referred back to the A1. If anybody can remember the A1, they used to have the the chevrons in the middle of the road, which was then to show how Everybody far you needed to be. The A1 is in England, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah. To to how far you had to be for breaking. So there was loads of these ideas that were out there, and all we did is really just pull them together and said, "What's a supermarket doing really, really well?" And we looked at that and we're going, "Okay, the screens." And there was a number of like scenarios that we looked at and saying, "Oh, should everybody be behind a screen?" We're thinking, "We're a service provider. We're a health and safety service provider. Will that look great if a delegate comes into our facility and we're all behind screens?" So we did have to like wrestle with a number of the improvements that we're going to put in place. But like I say, it was taking from the supermarkets, taking from people who had remained open. But then also I was, uh, like I said before, I was, I was party to the first one where we discussed about the, um, the Taiwan Taiwanese business um, that used to do the webinar on. And I, I took a number of points from them. 
is the things like um, there isn't a track and trace system like um, they have, um, unfortunately, in, the, in England and in the UK at the moment. But one of the things I loved about them, they had a, a number on the desk. So therefore, we could actually see where the delegates are sat each day. So we could then say there is kind of a trace system if we've got that um, number where the delegates sat. So in a roundabout way, um, me rabbiting on is there's been a lot of investment, both in time in the thought process, but then also looking at what's best practice where um, whoever had opened prior to us. So therefore, we could take that implemented here, but really being very conscious of the fact that we had to open different. There was, yeah, uh, we have a we have a saying is that we had to change the paradigm. And the paradigm was we couldn't come back full. We had to make sure that it was this gradual process. Yeah. So, and that's where we went with the 20 to the 30 percent capacity ceiling um, on our facility. And is that where you're at right now still, or are you moving towards? Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's yeah. with. We're still there at the moment, um, but the, there's a, um, there's a, there is a number of um, courses which are seen full, um, when we say full full to the new um, capacity level. Um, it's something that we're going to be reviewing over the next couple of weeks yeah, to see, um, is it like, do we need to bring another person, another trainer back, which then enables us to open more numbers, but still keeping, in essence, we have to keep to the core, which is our safe distancing and where we've been using um, on the on the sea survival side is where we're using um, dummies as props. Um, we can't actually go back to the full level because our pool isn't big enough to have 24 people in a pool. Yeah, so it's kind of we we'll have to we'll have to manage some of those constraints as well. Mm. Thanks, Paul. That was um, that was really helpful. Um, just to sort of illustrate that point um, of the, the investments that you've made, you've got the footsteps on the ground there, which is obviously something that you you picked up from those discussions. Um, what strikes me about this kind of um, development is that you've got a system that's been implemented and it looks like it's replacing an old system and is therefore here. And is that something that, is that a trend that you're seeing that a lot of these things you brought in are actually you're going to keep them? Yeah, so I think when you asked about the investment before, it's, it's very difficult for us to say, okay, we've spent X amount of money um, because we have spent that, but it's, we see this as a long term. Yeah, a lot of the things that we've seen that we've invested in is going to be here for the future. Um, so our automatic um, logging system, which is continually being evolved. Um, so therefore, you'd have the course literature that the, the guys could read on an iPad. But then also like our um, the cleaning stations, the new PP store, um, the new more PP that we've purchased. So in some in some instances, it's probably helped, yeah, because what we've done is we've had to think outside the box again and go, if we were going to walk through that facility, what would we want to um, see ourselves and how would we want to feel? And we've invested in that, but invested for the long term and not just gone out and, um, in essence, mock something together. We've, we've, we've really thought about it. How does this become our sustainable standard? And you'll see that with the, the signs that we've invested in. It's, yeah. Thanks again. Um, so, Gavin, I wanted to bring you into the discussion a little bit as well, because um, we've got classroom sizes has been one of the most obvious sort of challenges certain um, businesses are, are capable and, and have um, additional space, empty classrooms that are not used, that, you know, they're able to scale up or double the number of classes that are in place. But you're, you're responsible for the client side for AIS and Survivex. I wanted to ask you first about what sort of questions are coming to you from customers in relation to your policy and, you know, the availability of training? Um, is there, you know, what's, what are the trends in that area? Yeah, I mean, Paul mentioned it before, a key part of the um, process we went through in the, in the lead up to reopening was engaging with clients. So we spent um, probably two or three weeks um, speaking with some of our key customers and just Kind of going through our um, iterations of our plan so the plan went through probably two or three iterations as we as we tested it with the clients so that they had buy into what we were trying to do and um, so some of the things like reduced classes uh, reduced class sizes the the temperature checks and um, all of those were born out of conversations that we had with uh, with clients and some things um went by the wayside um, we had this big challenge around smoking shelters and um, funny enough it became a, a bit of a talking point as to how we deal with people congregating in smoking shelters but um, some of the measures we were looking to introduce we eliminated because of conversations we had and ultimately what we were left with was um was a set of measures which we were comfortable would be 
um, you know, suitable to adhere to the sanitation and the social distancing standards. But what we did um, intentionally was that first week, Paul was talking about the 20-30% was we reduced on a, um, a much reduced capacity. And that was very much about building confidence again, because we felt like we had a duty to the clients to help them feel comfortable that they were sending the delegates to a safe environment. So that first week was important to us that we were able to challenge a lot of those um, procedures that we introduced. And, and we did learn and, and we, we had to make some like subtle changes along the way. Um, food is always the, the big one, um, sort of food and drinks. And um, so we had to make sure that the changes we've made to that didn't impact on um, the, the customer experience because we have something internally, what we call the pop experience, which is um, pre, on and post course experience for the delegates. And the, and the, the on course experience is what most delegates um, experience. And a lot of the things we've done have impacted on the on-course experience because of, um, you know, less people on the course and all that. So we've had to strike a lot of balances, but it's been about um, building confidence and that confidence is definitely starting to be built. And that is being seen in the kind of gradual increase in the, um, the delegate numbers and also the customers that are coming back. So we had a, a, we had a period where customers were saying, you know, we're pushing trading out until, say, June, argument's sake. But now they've started to see, okay, I, I can see that a lot of the measures are, are sensible and the feedback from the likes of Mulhan has been great around that because that builds and breeds the confidence. Uh, Jonathan, is that is that something that you can um, sort of subscribe to? Is that having just gone and done the training, you, you can then speak on behalf of it and, and um, uh, inform the rest of your team that you know these, these adaptations are, are not going to impact the experience that you have when you go there? Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, I, I, we we currently have guys uh, as we speak at AIS training now. You know, so we fed that across uh, to to all of our guys. Um, we we wouldn't we would never push anybody into doing something that they didn't feel comfortable. But it's for me to be there first hand, you know, and be able to explain to the guys they they know that I wouldn't send them where if I didn't think it was safe. So uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a, it's a positive thing and. Uh, yeah, I think it's like I say, it's 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 been dealt with very 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 well. So, um, and a lot of a lot of the things that we're seeing working on on site as well, and and as we're traveling around um, and traveling abroad, uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't I don't really think there's uh, there's much more the guys there can do if I'm honest. Okay, so just a little bit more detail on. Um the uh, changes that you've made at AIS before we sort of invite some questions in and, and uh, talk amongst ourselves. Um, it's my estimation that if you wanted to make money during the pandemic, you should have been a contractor installing wash station. Um, mm -hmm. But again, um, you know, that's, that's a fairly standardized uh, implementation. You know, you'll find most training providers have, have done that. Um, and you mentioned Paul as well, um, your new facilities for uh, PPE washing and, and, and keeping that clean. One of the things I thought I'd raise was just a connection between what you're doing and what other big training providers are doing. We spoke to Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energies Orlando site uh, last week and they, they have a for quarantining their equipment uh, for 72 hours after it's used. Um, mm -hmm. There's some evidence as to why that is. Again, it's yeah choose best practice is that the kind of thing that you subscribe to or what's behind your thinking yeah so th there was a lot of investment went into the pp so that the the picture that you can see down in the right hand corner there was uh, a classroom of which we've converted um into a, um, a pp store and very much based upon that that would have uh, from a comatier's background is you always used to have a, a clean room and a dirty room and you could never go from the dirty room into the clean room with your with your overall so you always had um, three lots of overalls that you'd be using at any one time, one which was getting washed, one that you were wearing, and one which was sat in your clean room for when you were, when you were coming from your breaks. So we took that, that exact same principle from the clean and dirty room to here. The other one is taking back the airlines. Um, travel quite a bit with work at, at the moment, so prior to the COVID-19. Um, and one of the things is, if you think in any time you sit down on a, on a chair, you're going to put the um, the the blanket or you're going to get your headphones you take the headphones out of a plastic bag um, and that just gave me that feeling of oh these must be clean somebody must have done something to put these back into a bag um, and that's what we implemented here also is that 
any PP that's been issued, it's issued in a um, in a sealable bag, which then gives you that that good feeling. Well, it gave me the good feeling that I'm ripping something open. So we can't give um, brand new overalls to everybody um, because obviously the cost prohibitive on that. So what we do is we we invested in I think it was two or four new um, wash machines, four new dryers, um, so we could recycle in that way and clean cleanliness but then also be able to rip open. And that was just purely based upon I'm ripping it open, so somebody's cleaned it. Yeah, so I get a little bit of a better feeling. Yeah, so we did take a similar approach um, to the Mesa on that side. Sorry, just out of that as well, on the equipment side, um, we, we have introduced a, a new regime um, in terms of um, clean down at the end of every day, and we invested in, and Paul, you'll know the correct terminology, but the, the spraying guns that spraying down all of the equipment so i think one of the earlier pictures was about working at height frame so at the end of every day the instructors have to spray that down with disinfectant and then you know clean it up completely so you know that that is uh, very much an introduction to the regime because the cleaning regime was probably once a week now it's every day i think we've got that on the next slide actually uh gavin um so we've got the cleaning regime there for um some of the harnesses and equipment there um one of the risks, again, I mean, just the, some of the challenges that are being raised by having to do all of this is the longevity of the equipment itself can be yeah. affected. That's a bit of a risk, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's um, when we looked at this, I think when we watched the, um, the webinar on the Taiwanese company about the dipping of the harnesses as well. Now, we can't dip the harnesses because we're just, we're, um, the humidity here doesn't allow them to um, dry as quickly as they do in certain countries. So we, we've had to go with a, a wipe down process um, and we're using an alcohol spray wherever possible. Yeah, um, and that's across all of our equipment. But it has, it has um, resulted in us having to purchase more equipment as well. Yeah. So while we're on this slide, um, we, with a picture of one of your working at height platforms in view, can you just give us a quick overview of some of the adaptations that you've made in that environment? Gavin said the cleaning regime, but we've not talked that much about any of the adaptations you've made to training, um, you know, in in that area. So I think it, ex exact same as if we're using the dummies for the the rescue. So um, similar to. Um, uh, previous webinars that went through that, how they were using um, the Milan structure to take and um, hoist the, um, the, the dummy up to bring it then back down, how we're doing the um, resuscitation side, using a, a dummy again on resus side. So pretty much I, I would say that with the industry's probably gone down the same route or everybody's gone down the same route on the training side of wherever possible, um, if there was interaction, how can we take that interaction away to use a um, assimilation via a dummy um, and then also you'll, you'll see on the floors as we've got painted distances because we do know the team has to come together um, at certain times when there's doing some practical um, so therefore making sure that we've got the two meter and then the other one which came out from the oil and gas side was these um, um, called uh, virus static um, and what they were is um, for anybody who's getting on the, the helicopter going to offshore is would actually use the snoot and just uh, here we go. Live demonstration. Yeah, live demonstration of the snoot. <laughs> um, now, what the snoot was is it's uh, it, ha it hasn't got um, the the second rating at the moment for the um, the face mask, but every um, person that goes on the heli, heli on the helicopter to go offshore for the oil and gas is issued with one. Um, so we've issued all of our trainers, and because part of that was how do we adapt when we're doing the practical is that. Sometimes the trainer does have to talk and sometimes you have to come a little bit closer. So by using the snood, there was a quick pull up. Yeah, so because we all know what it's like to wear a mask all day. And that's why we, um, we went down the snood side. However, there is certain courses where um, if we're doing a confined space course um, through the, um, the rescue hub, where we know it's going to be tighter, we are issuing this as the PPE um, to the delegate prior to starting that, that particular part of the practical exercise.